only colleagues and friends that we welcome you to this panel. I apologize that we are starting a little bit uh, behind the schedule, which was caught by a longer presentation of The Hague as the legal capital of the world. Uh, this is what uh, Dutch claim, but I think rightly so. Uh, they were not the first one to invent the term. Uh, it was rather Secretary General of the United Nations, Boutsmus Boutsmus Ghali, who originally called uh, The Hague as the judicial capital of the United Nations, once in addition to International Court of Justice, another UN court was uh, based in The Hague. But this gradually number of institutions increased, and not just judicial, but also other legal institutions, uh, another term was uh, uh, coined. Uh, so, uh, the panel uh, this morning is to address uh, the issue of uh, evidence uh, before international tribunals. Uh, I think this is a topical issue as uh, uh, now more and more new types of uh, conflicts are brought before international courts and tribunals. And many years ago, and there were traditionally before international tribunals, state-to-state -state disputes. Uh, but uh, then, with uh, new types of uh, international litigations involving states, such as investment arbitration, and the really burgeoning area, where in the last uh, uh, 20 years, more than 450 uh, disputes of this kind have been uh, handled and uh, still over 200 are pending. And then uh, uh, there is an ever-growing uh, international litigation before human rights uh, courts and uh, traditional tribunals uh, like uh, arbitral tribunals with a permanent court of arbitration, or even international court of justice deal with uh, new types of cases like environmental disputes, uh, cases which involve a lot of scientific evidence. The question arises how to handle that evidence because each and every tribunal has first to establish the factual situation and only when the facts are established, then there is a need to apply law and uh, reach a conclusion. So, uh, before elaborating a little bit on other um, on these issues, let me introduce uh, uh, distinguished panelists uh, who volunteer to share their views uh, with you, and I'm pretty sure that they would also welcome and benefit from your own input. Uh, so, uh, on starting on the to the right from me, left from your uh, angle, uh, is uh, Judge Dmitry Jedov, who is now a new Russian uh, judge at the European Court of Human Rights uh, in Strasbourg. But uh, he mm, mm, has had a very substantial experience in arbitral disputes, having been a uh, judge at the arbitration court here in the Russian uh, Federation. Then, uh, next to him is uh, Mr. Hermodo Torres, Deputy Prosecutor General of Colombia, uh, who certainly will share his experience uh, in particular in a criminal area. Uh, Next to me is uh, Mr. Prado de Toledo, who is a judge, but also uh, Director General of the School for uh, Magistrates in uh, Sao Paulo. And I am at the right point introducing member of panelists because next to introduce is uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams is uh, a newly appointed uh, uh, president of the uh, Hague-based Institute for Global Justice, uh, uh, which is an institution uh, uh, which has to, and but he will be better to speak about it, 
which has to uh, engage uh, not only judges, practitioners, but also scholars and contribute to interchange of views and interaction between people in this uh, area. But he, in the past, uh, had a distinguished career uh, in the United Nations, having served as a director in the executive office of uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan, and also uh, for a few years with the current Secretary General, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And uh, uh, to his left uh, is uh, Mr. Planken, who is from uh, Dutch uh, Ministry of uh, Security and Justice, Netherlands, a country which uh, has both security and justice uh, within the portfolio of one uh, member of a government minister. So that ministry is in charge not only of judiciary, administering judiciary system, but also of uh, uh, federal or of, uh, state police. Let's put it this way. <clears throat> so, um, uh, as I said, the issue of evidence before international courts and tribunals has uh, uh, acquired uh, more importance in view of the new types of uh, cases and also the fact that uh, nowadays it's an everyday feature of life uh, that uh, to litigate on international plane. While in the past it was at the exceptionally, as I illustrated by, for instance, investment arbitration, but also human rights cases. Uh, um, in the European context in, uh, before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Latin American context and uh, now uh, there is a newly established African Court of uh, Human and People's Rights. So uh, these are important uh, matters. So a uh, question which uh, I think deserve some reflection are, for instance, what uh, distinction may be drawn uh, between the various approaches to question of burden of proof and standard of proof before international tribunals, to what extent would the reversal of the burden of proof in specific instances benefit the conduct of international judicial proceedings? Then uh, how the, the continental civilian and Anglo-Saxon legal traditions which have both influenced both influence the development of international law inform issues of uh, evidence before international tribunals uh, such issues as burden of proof, standard of proof, taking of evidence, admissibility of various types of evidence, the administration of oral testimony, the conduct of judicial proceedings on evidentiary matters more broadly, what is the role of uh, science and scientific evidence in proceedings before international tribunals, what is the role of expert evidence, including in testimonial form in the context of proceedings, before interstate courts or tribunals, mm, what lessons may be for, drawn from the treatment of municipal law as an evidential item by international tribunals, and so on and so on. The list uh, of issues can be quite long, but uh, as we have a limited uh, amount of time, some 55 minutes, I will stop here and uh, perhaps invite uh, the panelists and as I have introduced Mr. Uh, Judge uh, Derov at the first one, perhaps I invite him uh, to share his views with us. Uh, and uh, I suggest that we have a very liberal way of conducting the business. If you have immediate question, and once he completes his presentation, you can immediately ask. Uh, if you wish to keep your question, after all panelists have spoken, uh, then it's also uh, a good way of uh, uh, conducting the uh, discussion. So, Judge Jedo, please, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to say that the European Court for Human Rights is an international court, and its activity is based, or it's striving to be based, on not using any specific concepts or theories formed in legal proceedings on the national level. So from the 
point of view of admissibility, from the point of view of the concept regarding uh, reasonable doubt, it is formally nonpartisan. It does not adhere to these approaches, but in essence, it's obvious that since it's necessary that legal ends must be met, they are used in a broader in a broader context, more liberally. Uh, the court takes in all evidence, all documents that can be presented, and then uh, they are evaluated on the basis of their uh, evidence-based reasonableness for the uh, for the claims that are being presented. As regards the problem of violating articles 2, 3, 4, and so on, those that are connected with harm to health and life, especially when a citizen is under state control in prison. In these cases, the court adheres to the concept of viewing evidence outside reasonable boundaries. At the same time, the court takes into account the distribution of burden between the claimant and the state. This distribution can be transferred to the state or to the citizen. The specifics of the European Court for Human Rights, uh, which distinguishes it from all other international tribunals, is that it uh, reviews individual claims usually an international tribunal like the International Court of Justice does not review too many cases and it can be collecting evidence for a long time while the European Court of Human Rights receives several thousand uh, 60 to 100,000 individual claims which is huge the staff of the court is about 600 people this is a large legal machine which has which uh, which is uh, producing results uh, at a very high level of productivity so we treat the materials in a manner according to to uh, these circumstances the basis of the legal decision uh, is everything the claims the evaluation by the court. Since we're talking about citizens, about individuals whose life, health, and dignity are controlled by the state, and uh, it is often negatively controlled or negatively influenced by the state regarding their basic rights, the proof of evidence, the proof of uh, the, the, the burden of proof is with the state, especially in, in cases when the state controls the citizen, when the government controls the property, and when the government controls the documents that cannot be presented by the citizen. In that case, the court uh, demands that the state present those documents. There is a special article, Article 38 of the European Human Rights Convention, which uh, enforces uh, the, the governments to uh, present the evidence to the court. And if they don't, the court is at liberty to uh, announce the, the violation of this Article 38 acknowledgement of this violation for a state is a reputational risk. I would like to point out that evaluating from the point of view of reasonableness, 
beyond reasonable doubt. The claimant says that during arrest excessive physical force was uh, applied to him and his jaw was broken. After the policeman broke the claimant with the butt of the rifle in the face. The court reviews the explanation given by the government and uh, reviews whether these explanations are satisfactory. In this specific case, the state, based on the policeman's work, well, was saying that a scuffle ensued they fell, both of them, but the court did not believe uh, that a minor scuffle resulted in a broken jaw and believed the claimant. The court evaluates the explanations of the uh, parties, and in some cases, the court uh, forces the claimant to present certain evidence. For example, the claimant says that he was beaten in prison. And in cases when medical evidence is adduced about bruising, for example, it's done quite often. The, the court acknowledges the violation. But there are cases when the claimant uh, claims that he was beaten without any documentary evidence. In this case, the court doesn't have any venue, any possibility to acknowledge the violations. If uh, there were many of them, as for example, uh, it happens quite often with bad conditions in prisons. And the court often cites the cases that are already known to the court. The people who were in the same prisons often uh, complain about the same things. In that case, the proof of uh, the the burden of proof is much lighter, and it's much more difficult for the government to defend itself. the conclusion of the court is in favor of the claimant. Especially, uh, this is especially relevant for the early 2000s when uh, the court was already saying that the conditions in prisons are very poor and uh, asked the Russian Federation to improve the situation. The situation wasn't proved. And in 2011, a pilot uh, decree was accepted uh, in the case of Ananiv v. the Russian Federation. Another peculiarity of reviewing the cases uh, is uh, sometimes the European Court for Human Rights reviews the traditional international tribunal cases, state against state. In these cases, usually the, uh, the uh, testimony of witnesses and special expeditions of judges to the countries where the events occurred, uh, or uh, the court invites witnesses to Strasbourg uh, and these are the witnesses presented by each of the party. Of course, uh, in this sense, the quality of the parties from the point of view of evidence, from the point of view of defending their claims and their interests, the equality, and the equal number of witnesses presented, all these principles are very strictly observed. These witnesses can be cross-examined by the other party. And uh, the last important thing 
which distinguishes the court is the use of reports of international organizations regarding certain international events. These are reports regarding the situation in a certain country, uh, the situation with violations of human rights, extradition to these countries. There are many cases regarding the Russian Federation, for example, because they ex the, the issues are regarded regarding um, Kyrgyzia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, the Central Asian countries, and other countries, of course. The countries that are not within the European judicial system, uh, such countries as Morocco, Lebanon, and uh, these are countries from where people claim and the states prepare certain extradition measures towards them. So the review of the situation of human rights in these countries is used very actively by the court, receiving reports from organizations on different levels, like the various UN institutes, the Committee for Human Rights, similar committees in the Council of Europe, also preparing such reports. Independent international organizations, Human Rights Watch, for example, and many others. I also noted that uh, 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 we often find mentions of the so-called uh, State Department, uh, which is frequently found in the Russian media. This information must be critically examined by the court, and it must be reviewed on the basis of the previously made rulings with respect to similar uh, circumstances. In this connection, the court uh, since the European Court is neither the Court of Justice or the uh, Supervisory Court, uh, although it uh, reviews individual uh, complaints, it must take into account uh, the comprehensive approach in establishing the truth, as well as uh, making decisions about the violation of uh, some or other uh, this article of the convention. Thank you. Any question at this moment? Comments? So my understanding is that uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, you still uh, have this uh, free assessment of evidence by judges at the end. What is important is the ultimate uh, conviction uh, of a judge. Uh, but the burden of proof lies with the applicant and uh, the court uh, is not considering any need to elaborate a specific rules on evidence, like in some international criminal jurisdictions, like International Criminal Court or Yugoslav Tribunal, you have a specific rules on procedure and evidence, uh, maybe Human Rights Court, because its jurisdiction also covers state to state disputes, not only individual claims, although overwhelmingly it is overburdened by individual complaints applications uh, from uh, uh, physical persons, uh, acts in a similar way as the International Court of Justice, where we do not have any specific rules on evidence for uh, interstate uh, uh, disputes. And if I may ask, what is the relevance you give to newspaper reports, you know, because sometimes parties, uh, at least from my own experience, refer to what was in the press. Do you take uh, these press reports uh, as a serious evidence or is there any further need for any further corroborative uh, evidence? Because sometimes this newspaper evidence may have a problem that it emanates from one source. Uh, and uh, we have seen in the past that uh, sometimes even some PR agencies uh, have been retained in order to uh, portray a particular situation or case in the press. Uh, I have now in mind not so much human rights particular case, uh, but more uh, cases uh, of uh, open hostilities between 
states uh, which later uh, on had, had been considered both in criminal court, Yugoslav Tribunal and International Court of Justice and parties referred to in newspaper articles. So uh, whether you have some experience in the uh, Strasbourg Court with uh, reliance on uh, newspaper articles and clips, please. Спасибо. Очень интересный вопрос. Thank you for a very interesting question. It's uh, my opinion that uh, the mentioning by the media may be used by the courts, but as an additional additional means of uh, stating the facts. Uh, which must be complementary to the reports of uh, international organizations. In this case, it would be very important to emphasize that events uh, which uh, are described are well known to everybody and uh, have been uh, well reported. Although what refers to the European court, uh, because it's very busy, sometimes it takes too much time from the event itself. And people tend to forget uh, about the uh, events uh, uh, and uh, the acute perception of the event has already been lost. Uh, so it's a combination of approaches. And of course, there is a standard mentioning that uh, this case uh, has been uh, widely uh, described in the media. And there is uh, one more special feature which uh, presents a background for the situation. Frequently, an international organization has no opportunity to conduct an immediate on-site investigation, although such cases do happen, because uh, in such a case, uh, such an investigation would have to be conducted uh, directly in the process of the military conflict, uh, hostility, which is extremely dangerous. But you know, reporters are extremely brave people and frequently they want to be present on the front line and in the present world we can demonstrate uh, events and the media wants to show the picture, uh, the live picture, or just uh, maybe filmed a few days ago. Uh, uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Pemoda Torres, I'll give him the floor. You have the floor, sir. Gracias, señor presidente. Muy buenos días, señoras y señores. He sido invitado. Thank you. Currently, in the framework of international courts, the procedural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a problem with uh, relaying, relaying the relaying the translation to Russian and uh, translating to English. I would like to I would like to say a lot of thanks, cordial thanks for an invitation extended to me to attend this important forum and to say a few words specifically about the subject uh, which I have been invited uh, to discuss. Uh, essentially, it boils down to the uh, principles, uh, evidentiary, evidentiary principles uh, uh, for cases stated uh, before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Currently, in the framework of international courts, the procedural paradigm on evidence management is given by the rules of procedure and evidence of the International Criminal Court. However, this is not uh, the only evidentiary structure relevant uh, in this matter in international courts uh, for presenting evidence. Other courts have developed their own structures, of course, and uh, basically they proceed from the essential principles of the procedural rules and uh, evidentiary process in keeping the principal rights. And in this case, the Inter-American System of Human Rights has established its own court, the Inter-American Co Court of Human Rights, IACHR. This is the very instrument, which includes two bodies which uh, have competence in this area. And the things that an inter-American human rights uh, convention was signed 
and the Inter-American Human Rights Commission was established, as well as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. These uh, commissions are connected with the uh, um, Organization of American States, or AS. Uh, they facilitate and uh, promote and defend uh, human rights on the continents. In addition to facilitating these rights and uh, protecting human rights, um, the Inter-American Court makes uh, special uh, decisions uh, uh, which result in uh, specific rulings in adopting interim measures. On the other uh, hand, the um, court under Article 1 of its statute is an autonomous judicial institution uh, whose purpose is the application and interpretation of the American Convention on Human Rights. That is, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, has two competencies, that is providing advisory and contentious or litigious. Um, um, for purposes of this short presentation aspect of evidence, it is of interest for us the uh, litigious function, according to which the Inter-American Commission or a state party may bring a case before the court in order to establish whether there has been a violation of human rights or not, without any prejudice to human rights. Uh, at this point, it, it's worth noting that the proceedings before the court are not international criminal procedures. That is, uh, the court uh, does not judge the behavior of the member states and uh, member states uh, do not stand uh, before the Commission for violation of uh, such rights. Essentially, uh, the purpose uh, of this court is to uh, make a judgment about the behavior of individuals rather than states. And uh, they give uh, advice to the state that principles of uh, fairness and uh, uh, should uh, uh, human rights must be absorbed. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, member states uh, must uh, fulfill these rights and they must promote uh, human rights in these countries. Of course, the jurisdiction and competence of the Inter-American Court involves making a judgment against a state party and uh, therefore the practice of evidence to support its decision. Um, uh, elements uh, are included here which were specified in uh, 1996. In addition, through jurisprudence, the court has established criteria and the guiding principles on the issues of evidence. Uh, I'd like to quote an example which uh, refers to the jurisprudence of the International of the Inter-American uh, Court on Human Rights. Uh, the court accepts any type of evidence. In line with the statute of this court, uh, a different number of evidence may be accepted. However, it is clear that uh, there are certain restrictions not only on uh, presenting the evidence, but on the form of the evidence as well. For example, there is a ban on accepting evidence uh, which uh, has been obtained uh, by violence. This is, of course, there is also uh, a principle of uh, equality, uh, which has its greatest manifesta manifestation in uh, temporal equality for the request or presenting evidence. Uh, this is stated in Article 43 of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights uh, Statute. And uh, here we must say that uh, both the previous documents 
uh, documents may be accepted as well as uh, documents which have been uh, presented during the case. All the parties have equal opportunities in the case, in the proceedings. Therefore, the court uh, is free to accept those evidence which uh, falls within uh, under such uh, uh, rules, meet these rules. And, uh, for example, uh, evidence may be accepted which uh, could not be uh, presented early because of force majeure, majeure or uh, some other predicament. And uh, the process uh, of presenting evidence uh, is regulated uh, by the uh, procedural rules and uh, court regulations. So this is not just a formal process. Frequently, the court uh, uh, accepts other types of evidence. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights reviews uh, dynamically those evidence which has been presented. Uh, they are uh, so uh, not only people presenting evidence uh, are heard to, are listened to, but also the people uh, to which the evidence is presented. Uh, states uh, must collaborate with the uh, Inter-American Court, even in those cases when the court um, just opposes the activities of such states. Then, uh, what is important is the principle of publicity. It should be said that the Inter-American Court, when uh, it obtains uh, the evidence, uh, states uh, in line with Article 43 that every document provided by one of the parties shall be communicated to the other party by a certified copy to make it uh, uh, able to defend its interests, protect its interests. Uh, because uh, the principle of immediacy is very important. With respect to uh, making a statement before the court, for example, uh, the orality in practicing evidence. To ensure this principle, the uh, rules and the regulations of the court provides that the practice of evidence shall be, shall be done through oral hearings in which the statements of witnesses, experts, and uh, victims uh, shall be received. And uh, in addition, Judges uh, may directly interrogate or cross-examine uh, the practice of evidence by judges of the IACHR. This is another principle of immediacy, uh, which is found in Article 44.4 which uh, allows uh, the court to commission one or more of its members to carry out any form of investigation, not to miss any details. Then exclusion of judges from the process for lack of immediacy. One of the clear manifestations of this principle is uh, established in Article 19.3 uh, of the Rules and Regulations, which uh, requires the quorum of judges in hearing the evidence. Um, uh, saying that those who are not present at the hearing of evidence may be excluded from the rest of the proceedings. Uh, the sixth principle is the principle of uh, evidentiary reasonableness um, or instrumentality of forms. In line with this principle, the Inter-American Court has a broad discretion regarding the admission of evidence uh, brought to its attention. Um, based on this principle, the court may make some of the rules on admission of timeliness of evidence. Uh, and uh, finally, the Inter-American Court in matters of evidence uh, bases its rulings on the basically inquisitive principle of ordering evidence on its own motion or so sponte. This is in line with Article 44 of its rules and regulations, which says that each party may set forth any evidence in favor of this party. This is the principle, is the principle of uh, reasonableness. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, to make the judgment fair, and uh, 
At last, I would like to stress the importance uh, of uh, Colombia being a member of the Convention, specifically in the issues of uh, observing the rights of the victims, because uh, uh, we know that uh, the military conflicts which are not resolved today uh, has resulted in the situation when we have seen uh, significant violations of human rights with massive killings. Uh, these cases have been reviewed by the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. Uh, which is a manifestation of greater awareness and uh, uh, respect of human rights uh, evident in uh, all the citizens of the country. Uh, many rulings, court rulings, have been made with respect to the Colombian citizens uh, by the Inter-American Court and the National Colombian Court uh, uh, accepted uh, these rulings uh, because uh, we, and I believe it is the common opinion in Colombia, uh, believe that conflicts between uh, states and parts of states uh, must be resolved by international courts. Therefore, we attribute high significance to the issues uh, raised by Mr. Tonka, uh, which is uh, states must, be, uh, must observe international jurisdictions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pardomo. Is there a microphone, please, for the first question from the audience? Um, I would like to we listen to a very, to very interesting presentations about two important international courts, the European and the American court. There are certain uh, things in common and, and certain differences. What is the practice in the inter-American court? Are there cases when a citizen of one state makes a claim against the actions of a different state, not his state. And what are the rights of the state where, uh, what are the rights of the government from where the claimant comes? Uh, can these governments participate in the procedure? Uh, is there a, a tendency for, uh, for the state of the citizenship of the claimant to participate, because in the European Court for Human Rights, this practice is accepted, and it's it's quite widespread. We act in accordance with the Inter-American Convention for Human Rights. It's very important for the state to be able to participate. Uh, as regards the cases of Colombia, we had a situation when many citizens of Colombia had to claim and the state had the right to actively participate or waive its participation, depending on the stance it took. Usually, 
we were uh, viewing with prejudice the uh, states that declined participation, especially in border conflicts and border disputes. They were with border disputes. There were always problems and claims made by the citizens of these regions. So in these cases, the states were participating. And I give him the floor. You have the floor, sir. Eu, antes de mais nada, gostaria de dizer que o Dr. Alves Braga vai traduzir as minhas reflexões. Se puder falar isso daí, para você, né? I'm here to, to help Mr. Justice Armando uh, translating his idea, his appointment. Uh, me sinto muito honrado de estar ao lado de tantas autoridades importantes de tribunais internacionais. Very honored to be uh, side by side with so important authorities of these international tribunals. Muito aqui eu tenho que aprender e vou ser bastante objetivo porque falamos as mesmas as mesmas coisas duas vezes. Uh, have a lot to to learn here and we we have the same ideas about the same concepts. Conceitualmente, os tribunais internacionais existem com a finalidade de trazer decisões importantes aos países e à humanidade. Uh, the mission of this international court is to bring peace and justice to all the countries and people for all the countries. Com, com isso, é, repito, conceitualmente, nós, é, ao tratarmos especificamente das questões probatórias, nós devemos ter em mente uh, no aspecto uh, de um horizonte mais largo que todas as provas a serem produzidas devam efetivamente respeitar as normas, as leis dos países e dos locais onde são uh, executadas, onde, onde são produzidas. Um, uh, in this case, the importance of the proofs um, uh, demands that the uh, the rule of the country where the proof is going to be produced, this is the rule that must be respected. Isso porque entendo eu que até por uma lógica, o, as provas quando produzidas naquele local onde elas é, devam ser levadas adiante, é o local onde nós temos a certeza que aquelas provas são julgadas boas, elas são julgadas corretas, ou seja, naquele país onde as provas estão sendo produzidas, aquele país entende que aquela forma, aquele formato de produzi-las é o exato, é o correto e traz o resultado. Uh, this concept comes from the consideration that uh, the rules applied in, the, in a determinada country uh, about the procedure to collect the proof uh, is considered the best way, the best system to collect proofs, to produce proofs. So, uh, that's from where uh, comes this conclusion. Com isso, nós podemos entender que cabe tanto a prova testemunhal como a prova técnica. So, uh, as the witness proof, uh, testimonial proof, as the technical proof, uh, all kinds of proofs are accepted. Devemos também levar em consideração, muito importante, as diferenças dos países, uns com fundamentos da common law e outros da, com fundamentos da civil law, ou, ou seja, a legislação codificada. We have taken consideration the differences between the civil law countries systems and the common law uh, country systems. Com isso, é, a consideração que devemos é, ressaltar é que 
como nós poderemos ter litígios entre esses países, dessas, desses dois fundamentos, dessas duas legislações, nós jamais poderíamos impor em um país a produção de prova em que existe fundamento apenas no outro. Ou seja, seria impossível que existisse uma produção de provas técnicas ou testemunhais na área da common law, como é feita na civil law e vice-versa. We had to consider or remember that we can face conflicts between uh, the systems of two different countries, with disputes between these two different countries, and a court, a court from one country cannot impose to the other country the rules of producing proofs. Uh, assim, é lógico que as provas colhidas, testemunhais e técnicas da forma da common law, assim como da civil law, vão ser levadas aos julgadores de cortes internacionais e este, como em qualquer julgamento que é feito por qualquer tribunal, ele vai dar o valor e o peso da prova que uh, ele entenda seja suficiente a sua decisão. Ele vai considerá-la de acordo com a sua consciência. So, proofs obtained even under a civil law system or under a common law system, both kinds of proofs or both proofs are going to be can be submitted to an international tribunal and this tribunal is going to analyze this proof and decide about the validity of this proof as any judge does in any court. This analyzes proofs and decides if it's valid, it's enough to determine a fact or not. Por isso que nós temos essa ideia e esse conceito de que as provas onde são realizadas são realizadas e tidas como boas e vão ser consideradas pelo magistrado, pelo julgador, de acordo com o que ele enxergar, a forma e o resultado que ela trouxe. So the the organ uh, that has to decide is gonna must consider that a proof um, produced under or a common law system or a civil law system um, are produced or collected in the best way. So the, it has, the decision has to start about this consideration. É, e eu gostaria de ressaltar às senhoras e aos senhores que esse conceito se aplica a qualquer tribunal internacional, porém, nós temos que deixar bastante patente a importância dos tribunais internacionais que cuidam dos direitos humanos. Uh, this conception is applied to any any kind of court or international court, and mainly it's important to to say that is related to courts that decide about human rights. As cortes de direitos humanos, elas são muito mais flexíveis, elas são muito mais aceitas até pela matéria que trata. Basta que nós enxerguemos que, quando existe ofensa a direitos humanos em qualquer país, mesmo que se chegue à última jurisdição do país, a parte ainda tem direito a recorrer às cortes de direitos humanos. Uh, there's uh, expanded flexibility of this inter, uh, international human rights court and even when we have a final decision in a uh, country jurisdiction that decision can still be submitted to an international court in the cases of violation of human rights as outras cortes elas atuam por concordância por protocolos, por acordos e por uh, uh, estarem aceitando a decisão que virá daquela corte internacional. Ou seja, as cortes em todas as matérias que não atingem efetivamente os direitos humanos, elas atuam por concordância dos países que ali estão litigando. The courts have to submit themselves to the decision of international courts because there is a previous agreement to respect the decision of this 
uh, international courts. Os direitos humanos não. Os direitos humanos qualquer país pode recorrer às cortes que tratam dos direitos humanos. In the case of human rights, we it's not necessary disagreement because any decision can be submitted or the action of a state can be submitted to this international courts. Muito importante nós também tratarmos que eu vi como um ponto e já vou partindo para o final no que diz respeito à importância de questões municipais, estaduais ou de países serem levados às cortes internacionais. It's very important to mention the situation of municipal legislation or state legislation when um, and, um, national state is brought to before a international court. Normalmente ou eu diria melhor, a maioria das questões, se não quase só a totalidade, elas ficam efetivamente resolvidas nos próprios estados, nos próprios países, nos próprios municípios. As questões que possam ser discutidas, levadas adiante, que vá alcançar uma corte internacional, entendo eu, e me corrijam se for necessário, são apenas aquelas legislações que venham efetivamente a ofender direitos humanos, que venham a ofender efetivamente o que tem de mais precioso aqui no nosso planeta, é o ser humano. Fora isso, questões outras, questões materiais, questões, é, mesmo as indenizatórias, só podem ser levadas para fora se decorrentes de ofensa aos direitos humanos da pessoa. No mais, qualquer questão municipal ou estadual do país deve ficar restrito e resolvido dentro do próprio país. The majority of cases of uh, municipal or state legislations tend to be decided within the country, inside the country, and a case to be submitted to an international court has to say something about human rights or violation of human rights. Um, and if something wrong in this idea, please, uh, Mr. Prado asks you to correct him. E também gostaria de dizer que no Brasil especificamente, nós damos muito valor à liberdade e à importância das provas. Tanto é verdade que quando nós enxergamos duas partes muito diferentes em possibilidade de produzir prova, nós determinamos que haja inversão da prova, ou seja, a parte mais capacitada é que vai ajudar a produzir aquela prova que a menos capacitada alegou. Uh, the question of proofs, uh, it's very important and has a very high value in the Brazil system, Brazil considerations. And uh, an example of this is that when you have two parts, there are very uh, unequal, very different in the cap possibilities of producing proofs or defending themselves uh, in a case, uh, it's possible to apply a reversal of the burden of proof. O resultado é que nós pegamos o hipossuficiente e trazemos ele à mesma condição daquela pessoa ou entidade, quer seja de Estado ou não, que tem todas as condições de produzir o que ela não pode. By this mechanism, the, the part with the less possibilities, less resources, is put on the same level of the uh, part with the the, the more possibilities, so we have a, a weaker treatment, a uh, weaker possibility of uh, analysis of the case. E no nosso código está escrito que todas as provas devem ser produzidas de acordo com a norma, com o costume, com o modo do lugar, ou seja, nós respeitamos a prova de acordo como ela é produzida no local onde ela foi produzida. Our civil, our civil law determines that uh, the 
rules of producing proofs uh, must be the rules of the place where they are going to be produced. It has to be respected. O assunto é muito importante, o assunto é muito profundo, mas o tempo é curto. E me coloco depois à disposição para trocarmos, melhor trocarmos, não, somarmos ideia. Muito obrigado. Well, it's a very short time, and we expect to share ideas about this point. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Mr. Director General, for presenting your views and the Brazilian perspective. Uh, there is a question, perhaps I would say that let's leave it at the, at the last uh, panelist as we are really running on the tight schedule. So, uh, Dr. Williams, please. Okay. Well, f uh, first of all, I'd like to thank President Tomka for giving me this opportunity to be on this uh, panel on ev evidentiary issues before international tribunals. As he said at the outset, the Hague Institute for Global Justice is, is not a court. We're an independent, non-partisan institution in The Hague, uh, which uh, undertakes policy-relevant research, policy development, and uh, professional skills training on issues of global peace and, and justice. I note, of course, that we have in the audience the distinguished ambassador of the Russian Federation to the Netherlands, and I'm pleased to say that the evidence I presented for my visa actually was approved and met the standards of, of proof by, by his embassy. Uh, let me just uh, touch, just because I'm conscious that we are running out of time, I'll just touch on three uh, key issues uh, from the perspective of the Institute and the place, uh, a think tank. And that, the first one, it seems to me, uh, and the three challenges. The first has to do with the powers which are given to international criminal uh, tribunals and, and courts, whether they're ad hoc tribunals like the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, and of course the International Criminal Court, which is a permanent court. Uh, the, the powers which are given to those international criminal courts and tribunals and the impact uh, on, on evidence. Uh, for example, and in contrast, the, Neuro the military tribunal at Nuremberg had the luxury, really, of having powers to both powers of arrest and powers to seize evidence. That luxury, which the Nuremberg military tribunal had, is not something which was accorded to either the ICTY or the ICC, ICC. And that, of course, has an impact on their capacity to do their work and constrains uh, the work which they do, because to a large extent, they have to depend on the uh, support and the cooperation of states. So that seems to me a first critical challenge. Uh, the second has to do with the challenge which international uh, criminal courts and tribunals have in terms of gathering evidence during war uh, um, over large areas and the impact that has, of course, on establishing proof, uh, uh, ex establishing guilt or innocence. And of course, we've seen that at times when you have acquittals uh, in these tribunals, uh, it doesn't, of course, mean that the people who were acquitted had committed no egregious crimes. Uh, and of course, that has an impact in the societies and in the countries where those crimes actually occurred. And there's a broader, uh, um, I think, challenge then for the for those societies to have other mechanisms to deal with situations where you may have acquittals of people who clearly had committed crimes but for one reason or another um, uh, could not be convicted. That, to me, is a second and an important challenge. Uh, the third has to do with the impact of new technologies, particularly the internet, and how we go about 
uh, establishing criteria for gathering uh, such evidence uh, and how uh, uh, in this new uh, digital information age, how all of those things are used and presented uh, in those international criminal courts and tribunals. These uh, um, strike me as three key important challenges which these tribunals and courts uh, are, are grappling with and which they need to, of course, arrest, uh, to, to address, of course, to do uh, a better job in fulfilling their mandates. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams, for presenting us these three challenging issues in a, such a brief uh, way, very succinctly, but perhaps it's a good sort for a food sort, sort to participants, and I invite Mr. Blanken, Blanken to continue. Thank you very much, and good morning all. I want to follow up on the third challenge of uh, Dr. Williams, uh, because I think uh, uh, it's time to acquaint you, perhaps not acquaint you, or confirm uh, your interest in a new or a, another angle in a debate on evidentiary uh, issues. Uh, uh, I will uh, point out the emergence of electronic evidence and the consequences of this for jurisdiction. As Dr. Williams already said, much of the work of tribunals depends on the way in which states cooperate with those tribunals. But in the new digital age, it will become uh, problematic to uh, acquire electronic evidence which is not within your state because we are uh, traditionally bound by the sovereignty principle. And I think that principle is uh, 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 needed, uh, has a need to be uh, addressed uh, in this uh, issue. issue. Uh, because of the digital footprints that are left behind so easily nowadays, and the borderless nature of internet, you and I can go on the internet without any restrictions, but law enforcement agencies cannot do the same. So I propose to take a more cybernetic approach and not a traditional territorialistic or sovereignty uh, 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 approach. Traditional arguments for sovereignty will have to give way for the actual needs in this new in digital information uh, uh, age. I also prepared uh, 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 speech, I guess, of 10 minutes, but I will skip a lot of it because we are behind schedule, I uh, 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 heard. And I want to say two things. Uh, first, internet and the possibilities of internet have enriched our lives. We can do a lot of it, uh, but next to the sunny side is also a darker side. Uh, where there is money involved, criminals are involved. If they can make a buck, they will surely do it, and they can do it. Uh, but it's not all uh, uh, about criminal uh, evidence that I'm talking about. Our, our analog, our uh, traditional life is digital now as well. Because everybody, criminals and non-criminals alike, communicates via internet now. We use social media like Facebook, uh, and we store data like pictures. Uh, we take in the documents uh, uh, we made. We post real life comments in blogs and in tweets. So the electronic evidence is important because those uh, stored pictures, those documents and those postings can testify to what happens. For instance, to what happens in Syria right now. Or uh, looking back, such digital data could have helped probably in finding Mrs. Mladic and Mrs. Karadic, uh, or can help in tracing Mr. Kony. For this, uh, states and in the middle of the enforcement agencies and prosecutors are in need of access to uh, stored data and processed data and the transfer and communication of data. Now it's uh, not easy because of the sovereignty uh, principle I uh, already uh, uh, told you about. It has become increasingly difficult to get a hold of data for the use of evidence 
or as leads for uh, investigation. Current ICT innovations and possibilities encourage an international crime scene, and they blur the possibility of pinpointing the computer user and the actual perpetrator or the criminal to a given uh, location in a given time. For instance, a lot of things are stored in clouds nowadays. There are ways of accessing the internet in which you can leave your IP address unknown. So, uh, jurisdiction versus the ability to enforce law has become a problem. And I think we are forced to become more cybernautic and less territorialistic in our approach. We have to intensify joint operations we have. And if that is not possible because we don't know who to contact for partnership, we have to be able to act unilaterally uh, as a state on incidents coming from unknown whereabouts. We cannot consent to crimes remaining unpunished because we cannot get hold of the digital evidence and cannot use that in court. Therefore, we need to strengthen the international cooperation on this and we have to back it up with an international law framework. It's really necessary. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Blanken. And uh, you have ended up uh, on, let's say, the most uh, recent uh, problems in collecting evidence related to cyber crimes and these kind of activities through uh, the latest uh, media, the uh, latest uh, inventions of technology. Uh, so the floor is open for a few questions and short answers if there is interest, please. Do we have a microphone, please? <laughs> Good morning. I'm, I'm John Daniel. I'm from Brazil. Uh, you have mentioned that Facebook could be approved at international courts. And I'd like to consider that on Facebook, uh, people used to show a different life. They have a second life on the internet. And most of, uh, uh, mo most of cases, a different life, a better life than the real one. Uh, do you think uh, uh, it's a real good idea to accept Facebook as a proof? Please provide the answer, or maybe you can clarify that uh, whether there was a misunderstanding. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, what I wanted to point out is that we use different social media and we uh, use different uh, ways to express ourselves on the internet. Facebook is just one item of it. Uh, uh, we also uh, uh, post blogs, we uh, do tweets, etc. And I think a combination of various digital traces can be a more honest, uh, uh, t t honest way of testifying to a real life of a person, not a second life or the avatar life uh, uh, you lead. I'm conscious of the problems you, rise, you, you raise, but I think there's so much information in the digital world, we have to use it. Thank you. Okay. Please. Could you pass the microphone to your colleague? Uh, good morning. First of all, thank you. It was an excellent presentation by all the panelists. The issue on electronic discovery in the United States, we actually have a different uh, problem. We have cases where we have massive gigabytes, and so we have the, so much data that it takes so long and it's so expensive to try to go through and try to restrict what's relevant. In the international context, is there a, a proposed procedure of how to address that, of how to try to make it reasonable or contain it within what's relevant as opposed to the mass of, of electronic discovery that's out there? Well, maybe I'll answer myself this question. You are pointing to the acute problem because in some interstate uh, uh, litigation, the courts face the enormous amount of uh, pleadings and annexes submitted by the parties uh, without naming uh, the case which is pending before the court involving two Latin American countries 
In that case, we have some uh, 9,000 pages. And uh, as the cause is to handle several cases, there is in this flooding uh, of the court uh, with uh, uh, materials, a risk that the most important key, uh, key evidence uh, may be lost. But what helps the judges to focus is the oral proceedings, which uh, lately are usually shorter. In the past, the court had been here in some cases for six, seven weeks, two months. Now it's two or three weeks, and uh, we see what the parties refer to, that they consider that to be the most important. I'm not uh, speaking now about the investment arbitrations, where when you have major law firms involved, then uh, there are thousands of uh, affidavits, legal authorities, so boxes of documentation submitted to arbitral tribunal. I'm pretty sure that no member of arbitral tribunal is able to process that uh, mass of uh, submissions. Uh, that's a uh, litigation tactic and strategy. Sometimes these arbitral tribunals order the parties then to produce the bundle of key documents and then they concentrate and focus on uh, that. Uh, I don't know whether oh, my colleagues would like to add uh, anything as far as uh, your question is concerned. Any other question? Please. I have a question to Judge Dedov, uh, Dmitry Dedov, Honorable Judge Dedov. It is well known that the European Court of Human Rights sometimes has to resolve very delicate issues, review the issues of, uh, say, biomedical character. For example, example surrogate uh, motherhood, uh, blood uh, transfusion, AIDS, uh, infestation and so on. For that, uh, judges need to obtain special information, not legal information, but scientific information. Uh, how much in depth can such an examination be? Where does the European Court uh, get such data? Which sources are authoritative, reasonable, or because uh, there is no consensus uh, on the part of European scientists, uh, because you need to obtain a broad spectrum of opinions. Uh, does the court uh, use its own resources, its own officers and associates, or uses uh, some consultancy? And what is the uh, reasonableness and uh, precision of uh, information obtained? Thank you for your question. In my answer, I will specify because you touch upon two very important aspects which we must clearly differentiate between. First, it is the actual factual data referring, say, to a disease, to issues of uh, medical treatment, health care, uh, choice of health care specialists, uh, that would be medics or uh, stars in the medical sphere, and there is another aspect, uh, because the European Court uh, reviews cases which have already been reviewed by national courts. And it has uh, to check the efficiency of legal protection at the national level. In most cases, uh, it happens that at a certain stage of the review of the complaint, expert judgment is reviewed and uh, experts' uh, decisions. And if there are a few expert judgments and different uh, opinions, then the court has to count on uh, those rulings which have been made by national courts and how much motivated they are and in which way the complaints uh, have been taken into account by national courts. As for the more modern aspect, uh, the issue of bioethics, the lack of consensus, and I personally, with such a formulation of the question, I do not agree, because uh, the court is uh, the body which must find the consensus, the so-called consensus on the basis of fundamental values and uh, the values, the human values, 
which uh, provide the basis for the uh, Convention on Human Rights. But here, the approach must be very careful in view of the uh, subsidiarity, subsidiarity, because the system was established by the states themselves. And uh, as uh, was mentioned here today, the rule which was given to the states initially, that is uh, an opportunity to review such issues uh, from the viewpoint of modern developments and how modern technologies affect, provide an impact on ethic problems, uh, national parliaments uh, must be given an opportunity to hold such discussions. As for making decisions on particular cases, a court uh, gathers information from different countries, and frequently we see that in some cases uh, we find uh, a negative attitude. In other cases, uh, there is no definite decision. In other cases, uh, uh, the attitude is positive. So in some countries so there is consensus, in some there is no. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, com internet, Facebook, a minha única preocupação é no sentido que não pode passar our consideration is that uh, it only can be considered as a beginning of proof because it's a, a way, it's an environment where the information can be manipulated and editorated. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we could have continued uh, much longer to discuss this. Uh We were supposed already to be part of the uh, press conference relating to The Hague as the um, city which has been uh, featured at this uh, forum this morning. So uh, I, I think this discussion has demonstrated that the evidence is the key issue in all international legal procedures. I think parties have to concentrate, I would say, even more on evidence than on law because courts are supposed to know the law. But you can make your case only if you uh, establish the facts, relevant facts, if you make your case. And uh, justice can be only delivered on the basis of uh, truth. So uh, the different courts have uh, elaborated different ways of approach to handling of the evidence, uh, uh, human rights courts and Interstate courts usually there's a free assessment of evidence, uh, principle, adversarial principle, equality of arms provided to both parties, and then uh, judges evaluate that evidence. In the context of criminal, uh, uh, international criminal proceedings, uh, there are more specific rules because what is also important are rights of the accused. So the evidence is to be timely presented to the defense so that defense can prepare for. Uh, defending the uh, person accused. Uh, and uh, we have seen in, in some procedures that uh, prosecution was rightly criticized by either the trial chamber or appeal chamber for not fully uh, playing uh, uh, by the rules. And uh, new technology poses new challenges to not only parties, but in particular to judges. Uh, well, as far as scientific evidence is concerned, usually uh, the parties have to address scientific evidence in an adversarial context, but of course the courts uh, remain free to appoint experts, uh, their own experts, to uh, assist the court to evaluate the scientific evidence if it's in a special area. But I would always say that they should be very careful as far as uh, uh, video and uh, photographic evidence is concerned because with the uh, latest technology you can do miracles. So <laughs> in the International Court of Justice uh, exercised its powers and went for on-site inspection because in uh, one uh, case uh, between two European countries which concerned the river and the building of the dams, one of the parties claimed serious environmental repercussions producing even 
pictures, uh, quite alarming. But uh, the other party invited the court, please come and see. So the judges traveled, saw, and then they decided that is the best way to um, uh, properly assess facts and then decide uh, the case on the merits of the facts. Because as I said, there is a presumption, and I think a good presumption, that Yuna Novit Curia courts know the law. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here with you, and I wish you a pleasant continuation of this forum. Thank you.